Well, good evening to you, my brothers and sisters. What a joy it is to greet you. I am so glad to see you tonight, and I thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here. Let's wait a moment or so uh, for folks to log in and get started because we want to make sure that we're together as we normally do. We'll give it about another 10 or 15 seconds, and then we'll journey together in our Bible study tonight. I see you coming in. Hey, my people, God bless you. God bless you. Hey there, God bless you. Good to see you. Awesome. Well, friends, we're going to go ahead on and get started. Let me again thank you so much for being a part of the Bible study tonight, virtual C3, virtual Bible study. And I don't know about you, but I've just been enjoying our Bible study as we journey together through experiencing God. And we're inviting people, uh, not only in our church, but those who are part of our family and our friend circles and our social circles to get to know God. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through this great book that we've been sharing uh, over the course of the last few months, Experiencing God by Dr. Henry Blackaby and Dr. Claude King. We have gone through uh, most of the chapters. We've got just another chapter or two uh, to do. But tonight, we want to pick up where we left off. Last week, we were talking about how joining God requires obedience. And tonight, we're going to talk about God accomplishing his work, his work in and through us. We talked about obedience. We talked about adjustments and things that we must do. Um, but tonight, we're going to talk about how God indeed accomplishes his work. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we truly thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you, O oh God, for life, health, and strength. We thank you, O oh God, for being so faithful and kind and just to us. And Father, we know indeed um, we deserve punishment, but your grace is sufficient for us. Your mercy, O oh God, is, is upon us, and we're thankful for that, Heavenly Father. I pray now for these so people who are watching by way of the virtual uh, C3 virtual space. I pray, God, that your will be done and your kingdom come and that you would grow your church as you see fit. We want to declare tonight, God, that we love you and we thank you for being our God. Now, oh God, anoint your teacher afresh for this glorious hour so that we may teach your word with supernatural power. And, oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, we pray that they would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. In the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Together we said, amen. All right, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. Chapter 19, God accomplishes his will. I love the scripture reference that Dr. Blackaby and Dr. King uh, start this chapter off with. It comes from John chapter 3, verse 21. He says, but anyone, the word says, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. In other words, that if we're doing anything for the kingdom, it's not by our own doing, but it's God who is doing what? Accomplishing his work in and through our lives. And then Isaiah 46 verses 10 and 11 says, my plan will take place. I will do all my will. Yes, I have spoken, so I will also bring it about. I have planned it. I will also do it. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You and I ought not ever get on our soapbox thinking that um, because God is using us that we're the only people that God can use. Do you hear what I'm saying? God has so many other people that he can use. And the ultimate, uh, the ultimate thing that you and I need to know is that his will will get done. God will accomplish his purpose. Now, he wants to do it through you and me. He wants, to, excuse me, he wants to use us for his glory. He wants to use us for his glory. But brothers and sisters, can I tell you God's will will be done? You and I need to know that, that God will accomplish his will and he wants to do it through us. And so when we experience God's invitation to join him, some people insist on seeing some kind of sign. Yes. Lord, prove it to me. Lord, show me some sign. You know, it's, it's, it's even how we do on Sunday morning. There's some people who, are, who know that the Lord is leading them to unite with us and to join our church and to be a part of the fellowship or even not just our church, to join a church. And there are people that the Lord is, is speaking to and, and, and we'll stand right there and say, well, Lord, give me a sign. 
Lord, show me that you're telling me to join this church. Lord, show me that you're telling me to do this. And so sometimes I'll stand in the pulpit and say, listen, for those of you who talk about you need a sign, here it is. I'm your sign. Uh, because we are always looking for a sign. Uh, well, when Moses stood before the burning bush and received his invitation to join God in his great work, God promised to affirm the invitation in due time. Look, look, look at what God said to Moses. This will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. In other words, Moses, you obey and I will deliver Israel through you. You will come to know me as your deliverer and you will stand on this mountain and worship me. God is saying, listen, I need you to have such a relationship with me that I don't have to show you a sign, but at my word, you obey. At my word, you just do it because God is saying, when you obey, that's when I will fulfill my will and my word. Are y'all hearing me? That, that's what that's what happened with Moses. He says, uh, when you obey, when you follow my command, then, then I will deliver Israel through you. I need you to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Well, God, what if he doesn't do it? Well, that, that's not the point. I need you to go and obey me. And when you obey me, then I will deliver the people Israel. God's affirmation that he sent to Moses would come after Moses obeyed, not before. Your affirmation, brothers and sisters, that you need from the Lord often will not come until after you have been obedient. When Jesus invited Peter to get out of the boat and start walking on the water, he did, he, he, he did not assure Peter he would stay afloat. All he said was, Peter, come walk on the water. And Peter would not know if he could walk on the water until he did what? Took his first step. And you know what? I'm, anytime I'm using this passage or relating to this passage, I always tell people uh, that it's not in the text, but it's between the text. And that is, brothers and sisters, as long as Peter, when he got out of that boat, as long as he kept his eyes fixed and fixated on Jesus, he was walking on the water. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus and started to say, oh man, I'm walking on the water and started said, you know, look at me, if you will. I'm walking on the water as if he was walking in his own power. That's when the Bible says he started to go down. So once you obey God and God starts fulfilling his work and his will and his purpose in and through your life, that ain't the time for you to get the big head. Help me, Holy Ghost. That's the time for you to say, Lord, look and see what the Lord has done. Are y'all with me tonight? Listen, brothers and sisters, because we love God, we obey God. Because we love God, we obey God. We don't obey God because we're looking for a sign. We don't obey God because we're looking for God to prove something to us. Because the truth of the matter is he has already proven enough. He's already proven that he loves us. He already proved, he's already proven that he has our best interest in mind. He's already proven that he'll be what we need him to be when we need, need him to be it. So now he says, because you have relationship, remember we go all the way back to the very beginning with Dr. King and Dr. Black will be talking, opening up this book, this study that is all about what? Relationship. When you and I have a relationship with God, it's not hard to trust God. And it's certainly not hard to obey God. Listen, this is why sometimes we say, you know, uh, I, I, I can count on my friends. I can count on my family. And, and, and you say, well, how, how can you count on your friends? How can you count on your family? And you say, because there have been times that, that I was down to my last dime and it was my family or it was my friend or a special someone who stepped in time after time and uh, rescued me or, 
or help me out. Well, that we ought to have that same kind of resolve when it comes to God, right? Because we know he has helped us so many times before, we ought to be able to trust him and obey him because we recognize that obedience will lead to blessings. So the question is asked, what if the door closes? Suppose you sense a call of God leading you or asking you to do a task, to go to a place or to do a particular ministry. And when you get ready to do it, everything goes wrong. Anybody ever been there? Where you, you know, you, 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 uh, you know, the Lord has told you to do something. You know, the Lord is, has, has asked you to do something. Uh, you know, the Lord has pricked your heart and said, this is what I want you to do. And then you set out to do it. And you said, man, everything seems to be going wrong. Everything seems to be, um, uh, going haywire. Maybe this is not what God wanted for me. Maybe this was not God's will for my life. Well, uh, Dr. Blackaby and Dr. King, uh, uh, say, and I concur, that you and I have to be careful how we interpret the circumstances. Why? Because many times we jump to a conclusion that God is moving in a particular direction when it could be God wants us uh, he, he's got us in a holding pattern or he's got us in, in training. He's got us in some level of development. What, what's the song that we say? Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe that he brought me this far to leave me. Our problem is we think that when God gives us a task, that is going to be easy. We think when God gives us a task, that uh, it's, it's going to be roses. Well, can I tell you something? I hate to burst your bubble. I hate to get you all upset and in a quandary, but you need to know sometimes it is not until God gives you the task that indeed, as the some people say, all hell breaks loose. But that's not the time for you to retreat and say, well, this must not be God's will. It very well could be uh, that the devil has already gotten a taste or a picture of where God is trying to take you. And he's doing everything he can to try to stop you from fulfilling God's purpose and will in your life. So listen, what seems logical to us is not logical to God. Sometimes our problems are we start following the logic of our own reasoning. And then we have a tendency to neglect the relationship we have with God and take things in what? Into our own hands. How many of you been there? Me, I can I can tell you. There have been many times that I said, well, you know, the Lord ain't moving fast enough. Or 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 if if this is the Lord's will, it wouldn't be this hard. Are y'all hearing me? And 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 and, and there are times where God says, yes, it's still my will, but there are some things that I'm trying to teach you. There's a process because here it is. And this was great revelation to me when I read this in, 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 this, in, in this book tonight. Look at what it says. Usually when God calls or gives you a direction, his call is not the thing he wants you to do. He's telling you what he's about to do where you are. Let me repeat that. Usually when God calls or gives you a direction, his call is not the thing he wants you to do. He's telling you what he's about to do where you are. <laughs> so often we think God is telling us to do something. Could it be that God is saying, I'm getting ready to do it, but I'm I'm going to use you to do it, and I need you to be prepared for what I'm going to do, but, but you, you ain't got nothing to do with it. I'm getting ready to do something. I just need you to be responsive and obedient to what I'm about to do. Because again, it's not you doing it, it's God doing it. Am I making sense tonight? Listen, listen, uh, in, in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, listen to this. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and were prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. During the night, a vision appeared to Paul. A Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him. 
cross over to Macedonia and help us. And after he'd seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding, here it is, that God had called us to evangelize them. Okay, so here it is, church. God had already told Paul he would reach the Gentiles through him, but God, not Paul, was the one who was going to do the saving. So Paul started in one direction and the spirit stopped him. Then he began in another direction. Again, the spirit prevented him. What was God's original plan? His original plan was to reach the Gentiles. What was Paul's problem? He was trying to figure out what, the do, what to do, and the doors of opportunity were closing on every hand. In fact, God was saying to Paul, listen to me, brother, go and sit in Troas until I tell you where to go. Can I tell you there are a whole lot of us who are messing up with God because God has, has, has said, I'm getting ready to do something and I want to use you to do it. And we mess things up because we go and we, we got to be busy, got to go do something. Listen. Do you remember when 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 Samuel came and 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 it was time? Well, when when David rather uh, was chosen to be the uh, the future king, and he was out, uh, you know, out in the uh, uh, in the field, and 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 they say, you know, that that's 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 going to be the king right there. That's going to be the one. And uh, I'm sure David's father said, "You sure about that? You know, he have the attendant sheep." And, and if history serves me correctly, I believe it was almost 18 years later where David finally became the king. What's the point that you're making, Pastor McFadden? Uh, sometimes God gives you the anointment and the assignment but it does in one season, but it does not come to pass until later. Why? Because he's the one who's doing it. Now, now imagine some of us, if we've been out there tending sheep and, 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 and the Lord's man or the Lord's woman comes and lays their hands on us and says that we're the king, we're, we're the queen, we're getting ready, to, we, we, we're going to be it. Some of us, we would have dropped that shepherd's staff, we'd have left them sheep out there where they were, we'd have been uh, starting acting funny and haughty and bougie. Because I'm getting ready to be the king. I'm getting ready to be the queen. Now imagine how foolish David would have looked if he would have dropped his staff, taken off his, his sheep's, uh, sheep tending clothes, and start walking around town talking about I'm getting ready to be the king. Yeah, yeah, y'all ain't heard? I'm getting ready to be the king. And people would have been looking at him strange for 18 years. Because you cannot walk, as we're going to learn in a minute, you cannot walk in pride when God is the one who's doing the work. And when he's the one doing the work in his own time, it's going to happen. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? While Paul was in um, Asia Minor in the city of Troas, he received a vision to go to Macedonia and help the people there because God's plan was to carry the gospel westward toward Greece and Rome. He was at work in Macedonia and wanted Paul to join him in that place. What are you saying? When you begin to follow what you sense God wants you to do and circumstances seem to close the door of opportunity, go back to the Lord and clarify what he has said. Always try to make sure on the front end exactly what God is saying. So in essence, when you feel God telling you to do something or leading you to do something, ask him, are you telling me to do it now? God, show me when you want me to do it. Show me when I'm to move, when I'm to make the move. Show me what it is you're telling me to do. He is not calling you to a task. He's calling you to relationship. Do y'all get that? We're so busy doing that God wants there to be a love relationship. He says, forget, forget about uh, 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 the task. I want you and me to come into an intimate relationship one with another. 
you know, even Moses, as you'll read uh, in, in the Old Testament, many times he had to recheck with God on directions. He obeyed God, spoke to Pharaoh, and everything went wrong. But Moses didn't quit. Every day, every day, Moses was seeking God's direction and he obeyed them. Later, Moses could look back and see God's handiwork in everything that took place. How did, how did he see it? God delivered Israel from Egyptians in such a way that Israel, Egypt, and the surrounding nations knew that God was the one who had done it. My brothers and sisters, Pharaoh's stubbornness was not a sign that Moses misunderstood God's directive. Rather, it was a way that God performed, it was the way God performed an even greater work than Moses could have even ever imagined. How and why? Because God is an all-powerful God. Did you hear what I said? I said God is an all-powerful God. God is able to change your circumstances in a moment. If we obey, what takes longer is not the task. What takes longer is God preparing us for the service. <laughs> Do you hear me? That's the part that takes the longest because God, God can do it right now. But what is our challenge is God working on us to prepare us for what he's doing. What is that saying? Somebody, somebody wrote it to me uh, just this, this just past week. It said something to the effect of God, give me the character to stay where you have sent me. Something of that nature. What does that mean? Perhaps God in accomplishing his work through you, through us, Perhaps he wants you to be the one to bring it to pass or to have it manifested in and through. And he's just totally convinced that he's going to do it through you. But he does it knowing that you ain't ready yet. There's some things that I still got to work on work on with them. I got, there's some things that I still got to work on with, with, with her and him, because see, if I give it to them now, if I perform the task now, they may be under the assumption that they're the ones who, 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 they're the ones who have, who has done it or who have done it. They're the ones who have done it. God says, I want such a love relationship with you that you trust and obey me so much that when it happens, you say, look what the Lord has done. You know, uh, and my preachers, you all will understand this. Sometimes as preachers, you know, if, if we're not careful, we can get caught up um, in, in, in the hype, you know, that, that, that people give us about our preaching ability. Oh, pastor. Oh, minister, so-and-so, oh, evangelist, so-and-so, you preach today. Now, you know, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I did that. You know, man, listen, I, I, I slayed the house today. Man, I, I had them running and shouting. God says, no, 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 no. I need you when someone compliments you on your preaching prowess or what you have shared, your response to be, to God be the glory. Pray for me so I can get even better through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, y'all, y'all, listen, brothers and sisters. Does God seem sometimes to be working slowly in your life? You know, Jesus had about three years with his disciples. Isn't that amazing that, that he only had that short amount of time Um. But he said, even uh, when I leave you, there's still so much more I got to share with you. Some of you may be saying, God, hurry up and make me mature. Perhaps you're asking God to give you a new and larger assignment. But the question is, are you ready for it? 
Are you ready for the larger assignment? Can God trust you with the larger assignment? If you feel God is slow to work in your life, Dr. Blackaby and Dr. King said, ask yourselves these three questions. He says, number one, they said, number one, am I responding to all God is presently leading me to do? You want the bigger assignment, but you ain't doing nothing in the little assignment. And can I tell you, this happens, this is appropriate for, for preachers. This is appropriate for people who come to me talking about they want to be a deacon. Listen, can, 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 I, can, I, can I help y'all? Let me, let, me, let me share with y'all. Uh, uh, there's nothing magical that happens when you become a deacon uh, that, that, that will lead you to deacon. Let, let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Oh, pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to, you know, when you're going to be ordained a deacon, I'm ready to be a deacon. I believe the Lord is calling me to be a deacon. And I said, oh, really? Well, what are you doing now? Do you ever show up for Bible study, even virtually? Are you calling any of the sick? Are, are, are you doing hospital visitations? Are you reaching out to members already and, and asking, can you pray for them or with them? Are you asking the pastor, pastor, what is it that I can do in service for the kingdom and in service to Cornerstone Committee to Church? What are you doing now? Because nothing magical is going to happen if you get ordained a deacon. It's not uh, after you get ordained, all of a sudden, okay, now I'm going to go visit the sick. Okay, now I'm going to call people. Now, now, now I'm going to go and minister to people. Now I'm going to start speaking to people. The Lord wants to know what are you doing in your present assignment. That's the first one. Number two, have I obeyed all I already know to be in his will? Some things you ain't got to pray about is it in God's will. You already know what, what his will is. And when you know his will, you do what? You obey his will. Have you done that? And then thirdly, do I really believe he loves me and will always do what is best in my life? That's a question you and I have got to answer, friends. Do we know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves us? Can I tell you, uh, it, it may seem strange to some of you, but it is the truth. Some people really don't know that God loves them. I mean, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't love us like, like some people love us, meaning they, they love us today. And, and they got to think about it for tomorrow. No, he loves us with an everlasting love. And when you know he loves us and he loves you, you'll know that he'll always do what's best for your life. And then I'd like to add a fourth one that they have in here. Am I willing to wait patiently on his timing and obey everything in the meantime. Shoot, God, I'm tired of waiting. You told me this in 2022. You told me this in 2019. Ain't happening yet. I'm tired of waiting. That's almost like some of us who, because we lonely and uh, and are. Uh, uh, we, 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 we got emotions and we got feelings and, and, and we got everything that comes along with being by ourselves. Uh, and, and the Lord has told you to wait on the one. And, and you talking about Lord, you know, girl, this girl got urges, brother, you know, you saying, man, you know, brother got to, you know, got to do something. And then you go out there and do your own thing. Help me, Holy Ghost. And you make a mess of things. But then you turn right back around and say, Lord, please get me out of this thing. And the Lord is saying, did you wait on my timing? Just because I told you the Boaz was coming didn't mean that, you know, he was going to be there to, 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 to today. I need you to wait on my timing. 
I love the analogy that is used. Grass that is here today and gone tomorrow does not require much time to mature. But a giant oak tree that lasts for generations requires much more time to grow strong. God ain't concerned just about the here and now. He's concerned about our lives through eternity. And as a result, we've got to allow him to take his time to shape us for his purposes because larger, larger assignments may require longer periods of preparation. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? So God accomplishes his work in and through you and me. Because why? The Holy Spirit will never mislead us where God is not taking us. You and I have to be completely dependent on God for the ability to achieve his purposes. Can I tell you, church, as your pastor, I want you to know I'm not leaning and depending on my own strength. I'm not walking in my own strength. I hope you are. Because if we're going to accomplish the will that God has for our lives, we've got to follow him, the model. Everything the father proposed to do through his life, the Lord Jesus did it. What was the key to Jesus' success was what? His obedience. He was always tied or related to the father. Why? Because if you walk in a consistent relationship with the Father, then you should never, there should never come a time where you don't know his will. There should never be a situation in which you are not enabled by the Holy Spirit to carry out his will. Can I help some of us tonight? The struggle that you're having sometimes in knowing and, and seeking and getting an answer from God, seeking God's will and getting an answer from him is because you ain't had no relationship with him. And now you want God uh, to, 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 to make himself so clear and known to you when you ain't talked to him. You ain't been in relationship with him. You, you, you haven't... Uh, you, you haven't spent any time with them. And then all of a sudden, you, well, Lord, can you show me your will? And the Lord is saying, if you have been studying my word, if you've been spending time with me, if you show up for worship, if you, if you listen to my voice and follow my command, you'll already know what my will is. Christ, when you are in relationship with the Lord, is fully present with us to help us to know and to do God's will. What do we have to do? We've got to go back. Here it is. We've got to go back and adjust our lives to God and then faithfully live out that relationship with absolute dependence on him. So who are some of the examples that we can count on when we talk about uh, 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 throughout, throughout scripture that we can talk about? Moses. Only through obedience did Moses begin to experience the full nature of God. We see a pattern of God speaking, Moses obeying, and then God accomplishing what he purposed to do. God invited Moses to join him in what he was doing to deliver Israel. God told Moses what to do. Moses obeyed. God delivered. And then Moses and all the people around him came to know God more intimately. What? When they stood between the Red Sea and an Egyptian army, God told Moses, do what? Hold up your staff over the sea. Moses obeyed and God parted the sea and the people crossed over on dry ground. When the people were thirsty and didn't have any water to drink, they complained to Moses. God told Moses, strike a rock with the staff. Moses obeyed and God caused water to flow from the rock. God help me. When Moses obeyed what God told him to do, the people of Israel were able to experience the power of God at work. When Noah obeyed, God preserved his family and repopulated the earth. When Abraham obeyed, God gave him a son and built a nation. I could close the sermon on this. When David obeyed, 
God made him a king and greatly increased his power and the prosperity of Israel. When Elijah obeyed, God displayed his astounding power by sending down fire from heaven. When the people obeyed, God accomplished his work through them. They've been chosen by God to be involved. Can I tell you, members of Cornerstone, you and I, we've been blessed by God to be invited to his work. God has invited us to do God-sized work. And he needs us to adjust and obey and then listen to this. Not only will it be a blessing for us, but when people see and experience the God that we have experienced and they see how God has blessed us, we see how God, uh, they see how we are experiencing God in a new way. Guess what? They're going to want that. And then we've got to be prepared to point them to God. If you're obedient, God will accomplish great things through your life. But listen now, when he does it, as I told you, don't go get the big head thinking you all of that and a bag of chips. Because pride, you know, may sometimes uh, want you or, or tempt you uh, to tell your experience because it makes you feel important. You know, um, when I tell people about the story of starting uh, Ray of Hope United Methodist Church in 1998 in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, you know, I can tell people about all the work that uh, Sister Mac and, and, and my team did, Brother Kip Hankerson and Brother Kevin Hankins, Hankins and Sister Hankins and um, uh, uh, Sister DeQuincy and and Sister Kim and all these others who eventually came and, and joined our, our, our ministry. We started out with Bible study and we were at, in the house. And I can tell how we went out and passed out free water with our church name on there. And we had the gas evangelism project even back then. And we gave away gift cards and, and, and all of this stuff that we did. But let me tell you something. Out of all of those efforts that we did, we never would have grown from five people to over 1,200 members in six years. You know who did it? The Lord did it. And so when I tell the story about what the Lord did or how Ray of Hope grew, I could get tempted and say, man, let me tell you all that we did, man. I did this thing. I planned this thing on out, man. And, and we worked the plan. It's good to have a plan, but know that whatever your plan is, has to be blessed by God. And he is the one who gets the glory. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 31 says, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. Scripture shows us, I'm done, that when God did something through an obedient person or people, they came to know him and in new and more intimate ways. God revealed his name to Moses. I am who I am. Exodus 3, 14. Jesus expressed himself to his disciples by saying what? I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection, the truth and the life. I'm the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. Sometimes God takes you through some experience so that you can come to know him more intimately. While you up there preaching, preacher, about he'll be bread when you're hungry and water when you're thirsty and you ain't never been hungry and you've never been thirsty. Let me tell you something. God will put you in a situation where he'll say you need to know what you're preaching about so that you can come to know me, know me more intimately. Where you, well, God will put you in a place where you are hungry and you are thirsty and you ain't got no money. Uh, but he'll put you in that position so that you can experience him becoming your bread, your water, and, and your sustenance. So that you have greater preaching power to say, listen, God revealed himself to become I am who I am in a deeper relationship with me. But knowing and experiencing Jesus in these ways and getting to know him 
requires that we trust him. And when you believe him, adjust your life to him and obey what he says. And then indeed we will come to know him as the way. I want to end this chapter tonight by reading the scripture uh, that, that Dr. Blackaby and Dr. King put at the end of the chapter. I want to read it to you. Psalm 119 verses 33 through 35. This should be our prayer in allowing God to, in, 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 in accepting the invitation that God gives in accomplishing his work through us. Listen, teach me, Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I will always keep them. Help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Help me to stay on the path of your commands, for I take pleasure in it. That has to be our prayer, that out of everything that we do, Lord, we want you to teach us your way and help us to delight only in your way. Well, my brothers and sisters, we've done as the Lord has required tonight. And now there's time, this, there's a time for you to respond to the word. I pray that if you're a member of Cornerstone Community Church and this word has blessed you, I pray that you will pray that prayer of Psalm 119, that together we might be the church that God has called us to be and we experience him individually and collectively and watch him do wonders among us. Perhaps you're here and you're watching and you said, Pastor McFadden, I want to experience that, but I don't know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Then today is a wonderful day for you to make that decision. Perhaps you're saying, Pastor, I've, I've given my life to the Lord, but you know, I start doing my own thing my own way. Well, listen, you can always come back home. Perhaps you're saying, Pastor McFadden, I need a church home, a place where I can grow and be in fellowship with other believers. I want you to know I'd love to be your pastor. We love for Cornerstone to be your church. But you've got to take that first step. Just go to that uh, Cornerstone Houston, the CornerstoneHouston.org website. There's a form that you can fill out on there, complete it, send it to us, and we will get back in touch with you and walk you through the plan of salvation and or reunification. Uh, brothers and sisters, we're praying that God would grow us up to the head so that we might be the church that he's called us to be. All right, if you desire to give an offering to the Lord tonight, you can do that. You can go to that Givelify app and do it uh, very easily there. Or you can sell your gift to info at thecornerstonehouston.org. Or as many of you do, you can wait until Sunday morning, bring your cash and or check as we grow and we flow. Don't forget, friends, our More Than Enough stewardship campaign. We're on the he headed toward the end of that on, on Sunday, March 12th, and we want to end it with a bang. So I pray uh, that what you have committed to the Lord, uh, you will follow through on as we all will seek to do. Uh, let me tell you something. You want to make sure that you're in church on Sunday. Uh, we're going to have our cultural diversity Sunday. We're inviting you to wear uh, your cultural attire, African attire, whatever it is that you want to wear, uh, indicative of your culture. And we're going to celebrate that. And a part of our diversity uh, is we are inviting and have invited uh, Dr. Joe Gregory, of the Baylor, uh, uh, School, Baylor University George Truett School of Theology uh, to be our uh, preacher for the day. He's the preacher professor there. He's Dr. Greg has been preaching for me now uh, for about 12 years and uh, maybe even more. And so he's going to bless us. You want to make sure that you're there and we're going to have a great and grand time. We're going to have a guest psalmist um, who will be with us and will bless us in leadership and in song. So you want to make sure that you're there. I'm hoping and praying to see you there on this upcoming Sunday. Our children and youth will have uh, their time for every second and fourth Sunday, and we invite you parents to make sure that your children are there. Uh, lastly, I want to share, uh, asking rather, that you would keep in your prayers. Uh, many persons within our congregation will continue to pray, continuing to pray for Sister Sheila Wilson, continuing to pray for Brother Alvin Watson, continuing to pray uh, for Brandon Douglas, and I'm asking for continued prayer uh, for Brother Fred Pratt, who uh, was preparing for heart, heart surgery this week, and we're praying that God's perfect and divine will uh, be upon his life as we shared on Sunday. All right, friends, listen, I love y'all. I thank God for you. Thank God for your faithfulness. Let's continue to keep our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help, because what? All of our help comes from the Lord, and I still believe 
the best is yet to come. Let us go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for this lesson tonight. Thank you for teaching us what it is you would have us to know. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we indeed might know your will because of the relationship we have with you. And God, when it's, when it's, it's easy to know your will when we know you as our personal Lord and Savior. So Father, we indeed look for the best to come for you to accomplish your will in our personal lives and in the life of the Cornerstone Community Church. Help us, O oh God, to be all that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of God, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest in rule and abide with each of us now and forevermore. And together we said, amen. God bless you. Love you. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you on Sunday.